So the Galapagos has one of the best, most, uh, uh, and one of the best examples of endemic species. This 95% of our endemic species are still there, so it's very high. Uh, but also. That uh, there's a high th degree of threat to many of these species. So, uh, for example, these guys, which is probably many people think that Darwin, the way he started thinking about evolution, was because he saw the finches of the Galapagos. And of course, we know that's not true. That Darwin didn't. He misclassified the finches. He did a very poor job with the finch. Uh, it was actually his the crew members in his boat who did a much better job. And and he later they realized he hadn't done a very good job with the finches. Uh, but he was what he actually saw was the mocking birds of the Galapagos, which are much ni nicer because they are much, there's one mockingbird per each island and there's another one that's more general. So mockingbirds are much nicer to start thinking about evolution and that's what Darwin saw. Unfortunately, one of these mockingbirds, the Floriana mockingbird, is almost gone. Is uh, there's uh, basically it's, a, it's gone from Floreana from one of the islands and it still is in some of the uh, small rocks around the uh, island, but it's in really bad uh, shape. It's already affected by a fly introduced uh, fly that's called Philornis that's already affecting them uh, seriously. Uh, so this is some of the problems of places like the Galapagos, where the population of these species that are endemic species is very low. So uh, penguins, we probably have uh, uh, around 1,000, 1,400. There hasn't been a recent census done. Uh, flightless cormorants, there's around 1,000 also. Uh, mangrove finch, that's probably one of the big, big uh, uh, problems in the Galapagos right now. Mangrove finch only live in some areas in the coast of Isabela. They are very specific to these mangrove areas. There's only like 180 to 100 of them left, and they are already being affected by these fly philornis also. So there's really a bit, uh, they probably are not going to survive if there's a major change like climate change, and they're very much under threat. And lava goals also, there's not many of them, like 800 or so. So what are the impacts? Uh, I, many of my students always, I, when I, we have a lot of students who come and stay in our campus, international students and local students, but many of international students, they, they stay with families in the Galapagos and they always come to me and say, you know, I wrote to my grandmother in the States or in Canada or in Europe and I told her that I was staying with families and they always say, the grandmother writes back and says, oh, I didn't know there were people living in the Galapagos. So there's, there's kind of this idea that nobody lives in the Galapagos, which is very, I mean, there's this great documentary, BBC does this great documentary, and basically, uh, who's there in the Galapagos? Darwin, you know, and there's, there's the population of the Galapagos has to a large extent been ignored, and there's, people have not realized, there's like uh, 25,000 people who live permanently in the Galapagos. Since 1998, the, Galap the Ecuadorian government set rules so Ecuadorians cannot migrate to the Galapagos easily, but still people are migrating to the Galapagos. There's a lot of people moving to the Galapagos. Basically, Basically, the economy of the Galapagos in the 90s was driven by, by uh, fisheries. Now, more and more, is driven by tourism. So tourism is a mixed blessing for the Galapagos. It's both uh, a, a blessing in the sense that it brings money for conservation, it brings money for, uh, it makes people more aware of what they have. At the same time, it's one of the big threats because there's a lot of indirect effects like tourism uh, bringing more invasive species, uh, uh, changes of the, uh, of the land use and things like that. So the Galapagos uh, pr doesn't produce ma uh, many of the things that we consume in the Galapagos come from the outside. Everything from cooking gas to beer to cement to everything comes from the outside. And that has meant that invasive species have been growing. There's around 1,400 invasive species now. Uh, so that's a big problem. Uh, everything from uh, raspberry to goat, uh, insects, uh, guava, we call it guayaba, uh, types of trees like quinine tree, and feral cats and feral animals. Uh, these are all big threats to the islands and, and big concerns. Um, much of the changes also have to do with what's going on with the ocean. The, uh, and, oh, by the way, I must say, there's also good and uh, important success stories in the Galapagos. We have some of the largest uh, operations for eliminating goats. There's something called the Judas goat system because they put a tracking device on the, on the goat, they let it go wild, and then they hunt uh, the friends of these goats. And so it's always betraying its friends, so that's why they call it the <laughs> Judas goat system. Uh, it's been quite a successful, very expensive, but quite successful. Uh, what are some of the f issues with fishery that have created big changes? Well, some of it has to do with 
First of all, they started fishing for lobsters in the 80s. Huge demand for lobsters, and then at first people were just diving for them using apnea. They just hold, held their breath and they went down. But they soon introduced this, the hookah system. The hookah system allows a diver to go down quite deep in 20, 30, 40 meters and dive for lobsters. So uh, this was introduced in the 80s and allowed people to go and dive for lobsters. They started to overfish lobsters. But the real change came with sea cucumbers. Uh, sea cucumbers, as the Southeast Asia market was improving, more people were going after sea cucumbers. Like you have here in the West uh, Gold Rush, we had the sea cucumber rush. So a lot of people moved to the Galapagos to fish for sea cucumbers and they became a boom. And, uh, and in the 80s, in the 90s especially, there was a lot of fights between the Galapagos National Park and the, um, and the Charles Darwin Foundation against the sea cucumber people. They were trying to stop them from overfishing. They stopped the fisheries. There was, you know, they tried to, as you probably know, three weeks ago, Lonesome George died. Uh, well, poor Lonesome George was threatened to be kidnapped by the fishermen so the people at the Charles Darwin station had to hide him at night, during the night, so the fishermen would not come and kidnap Lonesome George. So all those things were going on in the 90s. There was a lot of uh, uh, people uh, very upset between the fishermen and the, and the, and the uh, park rangers in the Charles Darwin station. Uh, so uh, fishing brought a lot of people also to the Galapagos. And nowadays, the fishery is no longer an issue so much, uh, mostly because the fisheries have collapsed. The sea cucumber fishery is pretty much collapsed. The lobster fishery also is in bad shape. So if sea cucumbers, fishermen are not going crazy. There's 1,200 registered fishermen, the only people who can fish there. Of them, only like 400 of them are actually fishing because you don't make as much money fishing anymore. Uh, so uh, the, the, there's already even serious impacts. There's a couple of articles that came out showing that there's already uh, what's called urchin barns uh, over too many uh, sea urchins, mostly because they think they're not sure, but they think because they cut, they got rid of the lobsters that are, were controlling the population of sea urchins, and now they have. Uh, uh, the too many urchins that are overgrazing, so you have this change to to rocks instead of uh, algae, bare rocks instead of algae. So uh, this can be an issue now. Uh, sea urchins, for some reason, are becoming very invasive. The problem is that they are competing with the same sorts of food that marine iguanas and sea turtles have. So there's there can be a problem with that. And that. So what I'm trying to get at is that climate change in itself can be an issue, but there's other these other important changes that are already going on that can add to that or that make the systems much less resilient and able to deal with climate change uh, in the same way. So we have already, we've uh, also, uh, uh, there's, uh, we studied the land areas and we can see here, sorry this is in Spanish, but we can see that in the areas like in, uh, this is what happens during El Nino and we can see that a lot of the, basically I'm going to summarize this, but what it shows is that a lot of the invasive species do very well during in El Nino. Uh, few of the endemic species do well during El Nino. So there's a threat that during El Nino, during climate change, with an increase in the temperature, you have a lot more invasive species and then you have more problems like that. So that's one of the problems we see can happen, especially in the highlands where the warm and all the agricultural region is in most of the islands. In those highlands is where you can have a lot of, uh, you already have a lot of introduced species that are a big threat to, to the Galapagos and to the ecosystem systems. Uh, cacti and other species in the, in the uh, lowlands will, go, will have problems with, with invasive species. Also, we talked a bit about diseases. We have the problem with introduced mosquitoes and other, plant, uh, other insects. One of the interesting things of some of these mosquitoes is that in the Galapagos, some of these mosquitoes usually affect mostly, let's say, uh, birds but in the, or mammals. But in the Galapagos, because there's not a lot of mammals, they have learned how to uh, feed on, on reptiles. So they have changed a bit their feeding habits. So they're probably a threat in that they can transmit some of these diseases. Uh, to, uh, to the reptiles. Uh, so what are some of the th threats we think can happen in the Galapagos with climate change and tourism? Uh, there can be changes in the world demand. We don't know how, but maybe some areas that are not, uh, uh, that are not in the tropics can become more, more important 
uh, their people can become more, more aware of uh, carbon quotas and traveling to places like the Galapagos where, where, carbon is in, where uh, CO2 production is an issue. Infrastructure damage already occurring with, with some of the areas. Uh, the problem with emblematic species, one of the big problems can be what happens if some of these emblematic species disappear. So what happens, for example, in, uh, and we have tried to study this, if, uh, if floodless cormorants or, or um, penguins disappear, what will happen with climate change in the Galapagos? Uh, so just to finish a couple of things, we have, uh, we have changes in the tourism, in the pattern of tourism visiting the Galapagos. So we have more and more uh, tourism has been growing. Now there's around uh, 200,000 tourists a year that go to the Galapagos. So tourists has been growing in, and they're only this, this peak down here, this uh, is mostly to do with, like uh, Duan was talking, has nothing to do with management, it's just the Wall Street crisis that made less tourists go, but had nothing to do with uh, people not wanting to visit visitors in the Galapagos. One of the important things, I think, is that as tourists grow, also the number of people grow. So the number of people living in the Galapagos is growing, and that goes very much with tourism, and that's also increasing. Uh, this number of tourists per year, this is the growth rate of tourists. So there's been years when it has grown up to 15, 20 percent a year. So there's been some very important growth. The growth rate of tourism is, is quite, quite uh, important, uh, how tourism has been growing. Most of the tourists come from uh, Ecuador still, but a lot of them come from the United States, the UK, Germany. One of the things we see, and this is very important for management, is that uh, let me, uh, one of the things we see is the number of Ecuadorians is growing. So there's more and more Ecuadorians coming. Ecuador dollarized the economy, so we use the US dollar. And that gave Ecuadorians better capacity to go and visit the Galapagos. So we are starting to see more Ecuadorians visiting the Galapagos. And that provides new challenges for managers and for how you manage that population. Um, I'm Ecuadorian, so I think I can say this. Uh, many of the Ecuadorians that go there don't go with the same idea and the same mystique as many times the foreigners do. So you have, for example, that for many Ecuadorians, going to the Galapagos becomes more like another recreational place in Ecuador. So they go there uh, not exactly with, uh, with conservation in mind and all that. So we have, I think, one of the big challenges with tourism and the growth of tourism is how we make sure that this tourism that is coming, that's growing, that I think should be there uh, because it's an opportunity for Ecuadorians to learn and understand what they have. How you make that this is a learning opportunity for this tourist and that they under, uh, uh, they're better at understanding what they have and the importance of conserving the Galapagos. So those are some issues. Uh, there's more flights going to the Galapagos. Uh, between 2001 and 2006, there has been a 193% increase in the number of flights going to the Galapagos. More and more airlines, more and more uh, 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 products going also. But also there has been, there's less inspectors inspecting those people coming and going. So one of the big issues right now is what to do with all those ships that are bringing stuff to the Galapagos and how you, and that's a big, a big challenge because th there's all these ships, almost once a day, there's a big boat bringing things to the Galapagos. They bring everything from potatoes to, like I said, to uh, cars, to refrigerators. I still don't know how, maybe somebody knows here, but how can you control that and how can you stop uh, uh, snakes and geckos and uh, cockroaches and everything from coming in? That, that's a big challenge I think uh, we have. I think I'm going to stop there because uh, we still have one more presentation, but thank you very much.